Hello. Thank you um, for being here today and coming to our session. My name is Megan Kaywood, and I am the Chief Platform Officer at Starling Bank. Um, and my colleague Martin and I are going to be talking a bit today about how we built a bank from scratch, and in that process, transform consumer banking with a 100% cloud-based bank. So, to dive in, Starling is a 100% cloud-based, mobile-only bank in the UK. And we started up a few years ago with this idea of bringing the latest in consumer tech into banking. There isn't really an equivalent of Starling in the US because what's happened was up until 2008 with the financial crisis, the US regulator was really good at issuing banking licenses. They issued them all the time. But then with the financial crisis, they decided they wanted to consolidate. So since then, they've only given out about two or three in the past 10 years. Now, on the other hand, in the UK, it's the exact opposite. So pre-financial crisis, they didn't issue any banking licenses. And since then, instead, now they want innovation and competition. So they've issued something called Option B, which enables tech startups like Starling to come in and start from scratch, get the full banking license, and compete on equal footing with the banks. And the reason for this is that what they saw was that up until 2008, banks were reasonably good at keeping up with technological change. But then with the financial crisis, loads of new rules and regulations were being imposed and fines were being levied. And so this gap started to emerge between what the banks were offering and what consumers were starting to expect, particularly in terms of the user experience, how intuitive um, and real-time apps could be. And what we saw was that with the financial crisis, it coincided with some of the most transformative pieces of innovation coming to market. So that was the year the iPhone launched, which completely changed the game. And then all of these incredible applications like Uber and Airbnb. And I love using those examples because they not only use mobile and new tech and integrate APIs to do things differently and better and cheaper, but with Uber, what they do is they have this mobile-based platform where now I can order a black town car that will be outside my door in less than you know, a couple of minutes at half the price of the black cab and I just get out without having to worry to pay. But they're the world's largest taxi company and yet they don't own any taxis. They just connect drivers with riders. And similarly with Airbnb, they just focus on the tech. So they're the largest accommodation provider in the world and yet they don't own any real estate. So similarly at Starling, we wanted to focus on being the platform. We wanted to build the world's best current account. But for every other financial service, for savings, investments, mortgages, and loans, we want to have a similar platform where we let those providers plug in to offer them to our customers. So we're gonna spend a bit of time talking about that today. Before we dive in though, I wanted to show this slide to really level set on what Starling looks like and, and talk to you a bit about the user experience that we brought into banking. So this presentation will be relevant to everyone in the room because oftentimes people talk about how to you know, be customer focused, but no one really talks about what that means. So even though we'll be talking about starting a bank from scratch, it'll be relevant because we're gonna be talking about how we've used tech to really innovate and change the offering and the business model in the space. So if you look up, what you'll see in the center is called the Pulse. So as customers are using their app, they get this real time feed. And one of the first things that we really wanted to focus on was the user experience. So if you talk to a product manager at a consumer technology company, they would talk to you about things like, you know, how do you collect and present data? How do you understand your customers' pain points and solve those in delightful ways? Whereas a product manager at a large bank would talk to you about interest rates. So for us, the focus was things like, how long does it take to open a bank account? At a traditional bank, you would typically have to go into a branch location, bring loads of documents, come back with another utility bill. It would be a long process and it would be rather painful. So we made it such that you can just go into the App Store, download Starling, open a bank account in less than three minutes from your phone, uh, provision a card to Google Pay or Apple Pay or whatever you prefer, and then start spending immediately. So trying to make it super simple. The next thing, the next pain point was around whenever you spend on your card, the transactions are about two to three days delayed before you get them, and then it's usually hard to tell what that merchant was or what it means. So to the right of the Pulse, what you'll see is a transaction. So in real time, as you spend on your Starling card, you instantly get a notification of the payment. It has the payment logo for that merchant, as well as a map embedded as well. 
And then we break that down into categories of spend. So all of a sudden, customers have this insight into their spending to know how much are they spending on shopping versus travel versus eating out. And then by merchant, so how much are they spending at Uber versus Starbucks and all of these different places month on month. On the far left side is called card control. So another problem that we saw was that when customers would be out, they could lose their card. And when that happened, you know, they wouldn't know, did they leave it at the bar, is it in their pocket? They can easily just go into the Starling app and click locked. It will immediately be declined. But whenever they click unlock, then immediately it will be accepted if they try to use it. So trying to take the pain points and solve those in really delightful ways. The one on the far right is called savings goals. And that was from the customer need to just simply parse out money from their current account into, their, um, into a savings goal for something that they were saving towards. And in doing this, what we've done is we are 100% mobile-based and 100% cloud-based, which means our cost basis is much lower than traditional institutions. So we can take in deposits, we can lend it out, we make money on MasterCard interchange, we can take those deposits and invest it in things like gilts. And with that, that means we have a very low cost basis. So at the same time, we don't have any fees for customers. There's no minimums, there's no international fees, there's no ATM fees, there's no unauthorized overdraft fees. And we actually pay interest of 0.5% on deposits, and that's only possible because of the way that we've used the tech as well. So we started up back in 2014. We got the full banking license. We built the bank from scratch. In doing that, it was actually quite differentiated at the time. So there was a few competitors starting up in the space, and most of them saw the back-end technology as a commodity. And so instead, they would focus on the user experience and building a nice app, um, but then they would actually build on top of someone like Wirecard or Bancor. We saw the back-end tech as a huge differentiator. So we focused on building that out, as well as getting the full banking license. So most of the competitors in the space in the UK and EU also would just get something called an e-money license or would be like a prepaid card. But for us, we really wanted to compete with the banks. And to do that, we needed the banking license. So we raised 70 million in our first round of funding back in 2016, which is what enabled us to get the banking license with restrictions in June 2016. At that point, we started testing out the MasterCard debit card, plugging into payment schemes like Faster Payments, um, doing the location rich transaction feed, and at that same time, building out a full set of APIs in lockstep with the current product, which I'll, I'll touch on a bit at the end. And then this is what it looks like as customers are spending. So as a customer goes out and spends on their card, the image on the far right is how the transaction looks. So here when I'm in Vegas and I'm spending on my Starling card, it also will automatically say the GBP to USD exchange rate as well. And with that, using location intelligence, customers never have to inform us when they're traveling. It's just something that automatically um, is recognized by the location of the device and the user. On the far right-hand side is what it looks like for international exchange in the app. So if you need to actually send money from your UK account into a US account, you can do that all from within as well. So now before I go any further, I'm actually going to introduce my colleague Martin, who's going to talk a bit about how we built the bank from scratch and really dive into the tech there. So with that, I'd like to introduce Martin to the stage. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, so that's a bit of background about what Starling is, about what we do. Uh, and my role is to give you a little bit of insight into how we build it and how we've we made a, a bank in the cloud. So my journey with Starling began nearly three years ago, um, where I joined a small uh, group of bankers, of product designers, uh, and of engineers in a, in a tiny office in Mayfair in London. And we were given a pretty intimidating task, which was to, to build a bank from scratch. Now, a lot of us had, um, had worked at some of the larger banks, and a project like that would have had astronomical uh, budgets. It would have had many, many, many employees. And we thought we could do this from the ground up. And so from the beginning, we decided that we wouldn't have an IT department at all, and that we would remove this split between business and IT, the separation, and we would have cross-functional teams. If you're building a lending product, then you see at the head of lending next to the Android engineers, the iOS engineers, platform engineers. You'd have product designers, UX designers. And they would craft a simple, beautiful product, one line of code at a time. 
And so Starling was really born agile, and it's the first place I've worked at where really that, that ethos permeates the whole organization. I mean, many of us have been doing agile for the best part of a, of a decade, but it, invariably the, the, the process of agile always began with the developers. And the problem with that was that you'd never be actually sitting next to the people you needed to do the work with. The business would be on another floor, there'd be a platform services team, maybe they would do some of the fun stuff or they would pick up some of the difficult integrations. And the other problem was that you could never get this stuff into production. And so for all the banks that I worked with, the more difficult things got, the harder and harder it would be to actually get something into production. There were correlations between the releases we did and incidents. And so when we change stuff, sometimes we break stuff, which is fair enough. But when the solution is to, to stop delivering, then you also stop moving towards your goal. And so the changes pile up and releases become more and more complex. And so as a technology company, we would flip that on its head. We would do more releases, and with more releases would come less change. You'd be able to see what changes are going to production much more easily, and you'd be able to spread that risk a little thinner. And so as I see it, near continuous delivery is really one of the foundations of Starling's success as a bank. And so what are we actually delivering into production? So you'll see at the top there are several different types of APIs. So Megan's going to talk to you about the, the middle two in a moment. Those are the APIs that our customers can use to, stalk, to talk straight into the platform. We also have a separate set of mobile APIs, and we keep those separate in order to not have to worry about breaking changes, about backwards compatibility. Because at the speed that we're iterating, that would be quite a lot of overhead. On the right-hand side, um, things get a bit messy. Those are uh, our integrations into the wider banking world. Um, there's a lot of vendors on that side. And in the center, we've got uh, services, and they encapsulate some of the key functional areas. Of, uh, of our domain, the ledger, for example, merchants, cards, payments, those sorts of things. And then on the left, um, if you're going to split your domain into, into many little services like that, there are certain cross-cutting concerns that you've just got to deal with. So we use Elk, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana to move all the logs off those servers and to make them searchable. And um, we use Prometheus to publish metrics and Grafana to, to view those metrics. In our office, there's probably, I'd say, sort of 40 or so displays all over the office, and you can see in real time some of the card transactions going through, payments coming in and out, onboarding events. Um, and it really gives you a feel for what's going through the system, and that can be particularly helpful when things start to go wrong. Your, your head swings towards boards that you're familiar with, and you'll start to see correlations be between things. You'll see the exception count tick up, uh, and maybe there's a gap or a certain color of, of bar in the card authorization chart, and we'll, we'll start to get a feel for, for what's happening. And so what does the back end look like? So they're Java services, and we build them into Docker containers. And they all look pretty much the same. We've got Jetty, Juice, Guava, Jax RS. And we tend to be pretty careful about adding new dependencies. It's not something we do, we do lightly. And if it is something, I mean, we try and avoid also having multiple ways of, of doing things. And if you're the person who says, well, actually, I found a better way of, of solving this particular tech problem, it generally falls to you to figure out how we're going to move the old stuff onto the new. And so we really value simplicity and consistency. Um, and that goes as far as a, as we, as a monorepo. So we, 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 all of those services that I, that I talked about, we've got, say, 20, 25 or so, and they all sit inside a single repository. Um, and so you can run the whole bank on your laptop. Um, I mean, the, 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 the slowest bit is generally, I did it the other day with a, with a new starter, getting Postgres installed. And, and once you're off, I mean, we have a, we actually, you can run all the processes independently, or we've put together a, an app that will just start the whole thing up for you. Flyway migrations kick in, and the schemas are created, bootstrapped, uh, and you're off. 
And so this has a few organizational benefits. So we're always moving in, in lots of directions. At the same time, we have a, a consumer product. We have bank, uh, business banking. We have payment services where businesses can send money through our infrastructure. We have a more general banking of a service type platform. And so we often have deadlines, some internal, some uh, forced by external deadlines. And so sometimes we just have to move people around a little bit. Um, we have a relatively small engineering team. And that allows them, when they change teams, to really focus on the features, on working with the rest of the team to deliver things instead of reinventing the wheel. And being a bank, well, persistence is very, very important to us, obviously. Um, and we rely on the ACID semantics of Postgres databases for that. There's a lot of talks here and at many conferences about all the new tech, but sometimes it, it serves to remember some of the golden oldies of, of, of technology. Um, and at the same time, it turns out that SQL didn't stop being developed in 1992. Um, there's a guy called Marcus Winand who um, writes a lot about modern SQL, uh, about some of the, the newer uh, features of uh, the, the SQL language that don't get used a lot, but which really give you more tools to interact with your data. And so things like common table expressions that allow you to clarify quite, quite complex queries by having a series of intermediate tables in the same expression. Or windowing functions, which are like a, like a group by on steroids uh, that let you do uh, queries with lags in them or, or rolling uh, averages and things like that. And then the, uh, the constraints you can, you can use in Postgres um, are, are pretty advanced. You can do constraints across different columns in a table. You can constrain on enumerated types, on, on, different, uh, on a range of values. And then we use, uh, we, we sometimes when we have to, we use row locking. Um, we'll tend to avoid it, but select for update, no wait, where um, we'll, take a, we'll take a lock out on a particular record and ensure that no other process can, can interact that record for the duration of that transaction. And the no wait bit says, well, if the second thread does come in, it should, it should error, which is often what you want. Um, the alternative is to have the thread wait, and obviously you've got some danger of the thread pool being used up there. And we've now, um, we've upgraded recently to Postgres 10, and we're putting some, some prototypes together uh, of testing out logical replication, and that's a, a, a really great technique for, for shipping your, the write-ahead log inside Postgres, moving the data across your system using that. And it has a sort of quite generic interface instead of the, the normal binary format of a write-ahead log. It, um, it lets you actually write Java clients or, or just connect other databases, and, and you can transform the data as it goes through. So the more we go down this journey, the more we learn about it, um, and the more we improve our use of the database. Um, and all of this we build in the cloud. We have almost no physical infrastructure. And like the rest of you, probably, we saw really little competitive advantage. If, if, if AWS is so mature, if the security tools that you have available are so mature, the tools for interacting, then we should, we should use those. Because when there was that handful of engineers in a small room, I mean, we'd had a really high barrier to entry to just get to the starting line. Um, you've got to persuade regulators. You've got some really difficult integrations to do with wonderful things like SOAP and nightly batches of text files and things. And um, just the basic customer expectation is very high. You know, before you get into the fun stuff uh, and some of the stuff that Megan was talking about, I mean, you need a card that works, you need payments work, you need security. It just takes a lot to get to the start line. And so the, the, the whole stack is on AWS, and we're really happy that those servers, they run in AWS Dublin, which is one of the 100% carbon neutral data centers, so that makes Starling's carbon footprint extremely low. The services, Java and otherwise, they're, they're bundled into Docker images. They run an EC2 behind auto scaling groups and elastic load balancers. It's, it's relatively standard stuff if you're, if you're in AWS, but it's still 
serves to remember how amazing it is that you can do these things, that you can declare how you want your services to run, that you can say, I'll have three of these, but if you need to, if the, if the health check suggests it, go up to 10, and it's really quite incredible. And um, we're also starting to move some of those Docker images onto Kubernetes, and we run that on, on EKS, also on Amazon. We make heavy use of CloudFormation. Uh, at the time we started this, some of the alternative ways of approaching it didn't quite seem mature enough. Um, that's probably changed now. But um, the CloudFormation templates, they can get pretty complex. They can get pretty unwieldy. Um, but they have this really great benefit of being declarative. To be able to look at the head of master and say, that's what my infrastructure looks like, and go back through the git commits and say, well, that's what it, how it evolved is, is, is quite amazing. And it also makes approving releases much easier. Um, I can look at a diff in GitHub. I can see the green bits. They're new. The red bits have been removed. And I can, I can see it, the same principle applies of, of, of making small frequent releases. I can actually assess the impact of that production change. We also deploy Postgres uh, in the cloud. We use RDS. And Again, I mean, when I said we upgraded to Postgres 10 the other day. We sometimes have to, given that we're growing so rapidly, we've got to increase, increase um, the instance sizes. And that's also, uh, it's almost too easy, actually, because sometimes uh, it makes you a bit lazy. And I think, I, I think often if, if we actually had to plan and do these migrations ourselves, I think we'd probably spend a little bit more time figuring out, well, what's actually, why is that running at 70% CPU? Um, and you might address some of the underlying causes. And so what does a resilient architecture in the cloud look like, and how did we build one? So the first thing to say is that in terms of scale, we're not Amazon, we're not Netflix yet. And so we're not really doing this to be able to scale instantly from, from three instances up to 100 at the drop of a hat. But there are other benefits. Because if you're, if you're growing rapidly, then crashes do actually happen. And that code I wrote two years ago it couldn't always anticipate today's usage patterns. And so immutable infrastructure helps us to achieve that. If you don't allow any changes to, to running servers and you make your servers stateless, then it means that one instance of a service is always replaceable by another. And so a crash is seen as a health check failure, and the auto-scaling group takes it out of the, the load balancer and replaces it with a new one, and you barely notice. We're also fully bought into um, the idea of chaos engineering. We run rogue processes in our, in our infrastructure that, um, that just go around and, and kill service at random. It doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough. And it happens enough to force us to really think actively about failure and to really uh, consider how we become resilient to it. And so this environment of failure it's not, it's not something you risk assess and say, well, that might happen, so what do we do if it does? It's guaranteed to happen. And so that resilience, it needs to really be baked in to the development process and to each and every commit. And the other, the other element of uh, a resilient architecture is, is on the people side of things, which is it's really essential for us to have a practiced incident response. None of this will stop things from going wrong. But you hope that the things that do go wrong will be a little uh, lower impact. And we use PagerDuty. That's, uh, that's a set of tools, but it also includes some, some processes. Um, and you can see on their website. And we follow those reasonably closely. And it, it really doesn't take much for that incident process to, to kick in. And especially at the beginning, the smallest thing would happen. And we would jump up and say, right, we're managing this as an incident. Who's the incident commander? Who's the scribe? create a Slack channel, uh, and, 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 and so on. And we'd, we'd want to normalize this. We want the practice, and we want people to understand what their role is. Uh, and so that when bad things do happen, there is a, there is a sort of calm, a sort of control, and a, and a practiced response. And, and I've, I've seen this before when I've gone, I've gone back to my desk, and I say to someone, like, oh, that was a bit scary what happened there, but we, got, you know, we dealt with it. And they went, oh, I didn't realize anything was happening. I was only a couple of desks away, you know, because people are reacting in quite a calm, calm way because they're used to it. So um, we, the platform, we build, uh, build self-contained systems. Each service has its own database, and that, 
And the mobile apps will talk to many of those services, not all, because they're not all uh, mobile facing. And that should give you resilience through partial degradation. So um, if the merchant service were to go down, I might not see the enhanced uh, merchant view that, uh, that Megan was showing you, showing you earlier, but the rest of the app should still work. And you really have to, have to consider quite carefully because although there'll be one primary service that's the main owner of this set of data, there are always many secondary servers that need some projection of that data, some, some subset or, or function or transformation of that data. And the alternative is, if you're not careful, is that you'll have a bunch of synchronous calls. And those calls might thread their way through some of, all the, all, some of these services, and you'll end up with a, with a distributed monolith. So, um, so our engineers really, as I say, with this, with this um, failure being, being a reality, mean that they have to, they have to engineer, uh, the engineers, and they have to assess or and deal with failure, uh, really when, when working on each commit and when writing each line of code. It's not something you leave to a change board at the end of the process. Do I have a database transaction so that I can guarantee that all of these changes are committed or none at all, and the database will be left in a consistent state? Well, if you've got many servers, that's not going to happen unless you hold some, uh, some lock across the whole lot, which then becomes your bottleneck. And so with our consistent approach that all our apps behave very, very similarly, we have some recurring themes about how the kinds of failure scenarios that, that we have to deal with. And we've developed a collection of patterns and how to handle them, and people teach them to each other. Um, and one of those is, um, it's got the acronym DITTO, and it stands for Do Item Potent Things to Others, which is a pretty curious phrase. Um, but the idea of, of item potence is that if you were to send an identical message many, many times to a server, then that would be the same as if it had only been sent once. So the, that first call does whatever. The first call that's completely processed does whatever the call is supposed to, and any identical call subsequently um, returns the same response but uh, doesn't perform any action. And an example might be if we receive from an external system an inbound payment, I'm going to want to send that notification that Megan showed you. I'm going to need to send some postings to the ledger um, to, to create some accounting entries for the movement of, of funds. And any of those servers might fail, and they might fail at various stages where possibly it, it wrote to the database. The client server, payment server in this example, wrote to the database but didn't get around to actually sending it to the other service, or, or perhaps the notification server received it and processed it but wasn't able to send the response back, so the payment server is none the wiser. And so as long as you persist that stay on the, on the client side, and your calls are item potent, then you're able to, to replay them as often as you like. And eventually, one of those calls will come through, and you'll record the result, and the cycle will, will complete. And so the other thing this, um, this, this gives you is, is a quite an interesting resilience to certain types of bugs that, that we see. Um, an example might be if, if the payment example that I gave you, let's say the, the message we'd received had sort of changed in a subtle way or we received a type we hadn't noticed before and we hadn't coded it correctly, and we ended up sending a, a, an invalid message to the ledger. Well, the ledger can be quite strict and say, well, you've sent me a negative value. I can't create postings with a negative value. So I'll reject that. I may have some validation right at the front, or I'll probably have some database constraints as well um, at the back. And so in that example, the payment service can, can keep retrying. In the meantime, we look at our monitoring, and we see that the... Um, we see exceptions in Kibana logs, and we start to investigate, and we put together a release. And eventually, you deploy the release. The message is retried yet again. And finally, it completes and is recorded as having been done. 
So I said before that continuous delivery, uh, or near continuous delivery into production is really one of our foundations. And we do quite a lot of it. So we do it at least uh, on average once per day. Um, but that's an average, it's increasing quite rapidly because we have more engineers, so we have more commits. And if we're trying to keep the, the average change about the same, then we must do more releases. But this releasing at will, the ability to, to release with a minimum of fuss, with a minimum of anxiety, it feel, fills the team with quite a bit of confidence and with a real positive feeling of progress. It also makes the lives of reviewers and approvers much more easily because you can reason about the changes that are going into production. And then if something does go wrong, as I, the example I gave, well, you know, you have the confidence to say that the fix is only a short time away. We don't do evening or weekend releases unless under pretty exceptional circumstances, and that's um, for two reasons. One is like probably a lot of your systems, we're under continual load, so there is no out of hours. And if you're not confident releasing at the busiest time, then how can you be confident to release at any other time? And the second reason is that if something does go wrong, we're going to need people to be around and to talk to each other and to, for the incident response process to kick in. And it's generally preferable for those people to be awake and to be sober. And so I talked about resilience to failure. Um, and it turns out that uh, releases really are little more than orchestrated failures. The only difference really between a release and a crash or a chaos event is that I've carefully changed a number before, before doing it. And so we've built this service called Roller that is dedicated to this, rolling changes into, into production. And um, it changes that version number, and then it orchestrates the... the, the the gentle killing of, the, of, of all the servers. And so I'm going to finish uh, by showing you a little bit more about what one of these near-continuous releases looks like. So as I said, we've got this um, application called Roller. Um, we consider it a core service, like the ones I described before. Um, it uses the same tech stack. It's Java with a Postgres database. And as I said, we like the simplicity and consistency. I don't want this to turn into one of those services that only Johnny knows about and he left last week, so now no one wants to touch it. You know, it, the platform engineers need to be confident that they can get involved. And so in a minute, I'm going to hand over back to, back to Megan, and she'll tell us a little bit about the APIs that we've built um, and about how we help our customers control finances. But the release process is actually another good example of, of, of the use of APIs, but this time we're the consumer, we're the customer. And here's approximately what that release looks like. It's um, when you've pushed a, a, a commit or you've merged a commit into master following a pull request, the Team City build picks it up. It runs the unit tests. It starts up uh, all of the services and uh, runs integration tests against them. And it builds it into a Docker container, and that's then pushed into Keto.io, which is our Docker repository where it's scanned. And then it ends up in demo soon after. In our demo environment, it's, it's pretty messy and it's realistic. And it's a really good place to test. We've actually never deleted. We've never, we've never started again with demo since the beginning of the bank. And so we have a huge number of customers. We have processes that are constantly pushing fake customers and fake transactions through there. And so it becomes a pretty good way, actually, to verify that your, your changes uh, work. And so at this point, it's only really a matter of time before someone announces, well, I need to do a release, I've got a fix to get out, or a new feature that's going out. Or actually, it's just been a few releases since we've done it, and we probably ought to, ought to do another one. So the first question is, what version is available? What can I release? Um, so I'll log into, this, uh, into our web console, and that's the same web console we use for all of our other back office work, uh, where we do payment operations, the contact center um, can access certain customer information. And with the right role, you can have permission to the screens that allow you to create this release. And so that call to Keto.io through the API, it's going to list the available versions. And as I said, the, the roller has its own database, so it reads those and writes them into our Postgres database. And then the next question is, well, what's changed? 
And so the, the, the role, roller knows in the database what the current state of each service is, and now it knows what the desired state is. So there's a call through the API into GitHub, and we ask the question, what's the diff between these, these two versions? And so we get a list of commits and commit authors. We read them in, and again, we write them into, into the database. And then the next thing is, well, well, are these commits safe for production? And that's a question for the, for the author or the, the PR approver. And so we use Slack. We, we use the Slack API. We send a message into Slack addressed at the, the author. And the question is, well, that, re, that commit is now in, in demo. Have you tested it? Are you confident? Are you happy that that's good to go into production? And at this point, I mean, anyone can veto this process by just not saying yes to it. But there's a button on that message. You press the button, and it sends a, sends a message back into platform. And again, it records that fact that the commit has been approved, and by who and by when. And then there's tech and business approvals. So tech approval is about saying, well, look at the set of these commits. Is there anything across these that's, um, uh, that's, that's, um, that might be unsafe? And business approval is, is the general environment good? Is it safe to do a release now? And so we like to consider these, these approvals a bit more. We'd like to move towards them being a bit more like gates. And so you could imagine having a scenario where business approval is always granted, say, between 9 and 4 a.m. Monday to Friday, except maybe when the diary suggests that uh, there's a big demo on somewhere. And you could say, well, whenever a commit rolls into demo, you send that Slack notification at that point, and then the commits are authorized asynchronously. And then you could say, well, for, 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 for tech approval, what's our appetite? Like, what, what are we, how much change are we willing to accumulate before we need to do a release? And so if you were to hit that threshold, whether it's number of commits or lines of code, or maybe it's concurrent changes to SQL files, which tend to be pretty risky, well, then you collect those up, and you could automatically create one of those releases, round robin the tech approvers, and say, it's your turn to release that. And then as soon as that's released, well, the system has everything it needs to, to roll the release forward to the next version. And so uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of, of some, it's a, it's a short time to explain how to build a bank, but it's given you hopefully a few, a little bit of an overview of what we do, and especially how we use APIs. So I'm going to hand back to, to Megan now, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about how, uh, how we use, uh, give APIs to our customers. Thank you. Great. So one of the things that we did as we were building out the bank is we built out a full set of open APIs and locks up with the current product. And this was pretty unheard of in banking. But what we had seen is that APIs have been fundamentally changing the way that software was built and brought to market in consumer technology because developers were realizing that much of the functionality they were building into their apps was redundant to what someone else had already been toiling over. So rather than reinventing the wheel, they could strategically integrate in those services via API instead. And that way, they would have more time to focus on their own core differentiating feature set and get to market faster and at lower cost. And so we decided for multiple reasons, we wanted to build a similar type of platform into Starling. So on the one hand, we wanted to have this full set of open APIs manifesting all of the functionality from Starling, really looking to manifest every single feature in Starling via an API, such that a community of developers could innovate on that with this idea that inevitably, whenever you have this community of developers innovating, they can think up more interesting and new products than we could inside the company alone. But taking it further, what you see here is that we also knew that we wanted to be the world's best bank account, but we couldn't also be the world's best mortgage and savings and investment all at the same time. So we wanted to bring that type of Uber and Airbnb model of a platform into banking for the first time and strategically integrate those services in via API. And this was quite a shift because up until that point for banks, if you were to share your data with a third party, your only option was really screen scraping, right? So you'd have to you know, go into Mint and give them your bank credentials, and then they would scrape all of your data in a very insecure and inefficient way. And that's how you could do it. And then when you did that, it would violate the terms and conditions on your bank account. So if there's any fraud, then it was all on you. And that was because the banks felt like they owned the customer's data. So if you tried to share it, it violated the terms and conditions. But 
The reason why they did that in part was also because of the fact that their, their business model was to incentivize the customer to join the current account with some sort of, or the, the checking account, with some sort of loss making introductory offer, maybe a cash lump sum or something or other. But then they actually made most of their money by upselling these higher profit financial products. So now when we live in this world where there's lots of fintech startups starting up and they'll focus on doing one thing and doing it really well, and they usually do it and they're mobile based and they have a totally different cost basis and much lower fees, then that starts to nip away at the bank's revenue. So one way to hedge against that competition was by not letting customers share their data. We decided instead to take the viewpoint that customers own their own data and we want to help them share that securely should they choose to do so. But also, rather than upselling them other products, we'll just integrate them in to give them choice and transparency of their options and try to intelligently use their data to help them make better financial decisions. So how did we do that? So step one was building out the full set of open APIs. To do that, we built out this developer portal and we really had this idea that the API is only so good as it is accessible. This means really good documentation, um, creating developer tools like webhooks and SDKs, making it so you could easily set up an account and test it in a sandbox. So, um, Whenever you go into Starling in our developer portal, you create an account, you can immediately create a personal access token, which will enable you to link your personal Starling account with your developer account. Then you can choose your permissions. So we have everything from basic read-only data, you can see our account read, address read, balance card, et cetera, all the way up to writing payments via the API. And then that's it. You can script your bank account, do whatever you want with your own data. The next thing is around the sandbox. So because we're integrating in other third parties into Starling, one of the main things we do is we have them integrate our API. And that's because we found that when a customer needs to access another financial product, they always enter in the same information over and over. Their name, their address, their date of birth, their account number, their sort code. And so when these financial services partner with Starling, they integrate our API such that customers can automatically authorize us to share that across and streamline setup. And so whenever they're going through and building that out, they can easily test in our sandbox. Sandbox mirrors all of the, the public functionality. So in that, they can choose their access tier, they can simulate transactions, fake spending history, um, and experiment and test is all they need. So with that, there's different tiers of access, which I'll show you here. So with making this accessible, one of the key things in a bank is that you have processes that enable you to move quickly. That's just as important for external partnerships as it is for internal processes. So one of the things that we really tried to streamline was due diligence and contract and the entire paperwork side, and this is part of how we did it. So when a customer wants to grant access to a third party, we've already done due diligence on that partner. We've reviewed you know, their data protection, their information security. We've looked at pen test results. We're making sure they're encrypting data at rest and in transit. And the level of that due diligence we do is based off of the tier that they want. So if they only want the basic tier one, there's a lesser amount of due diligence required than if they're wanting to actually instruct payments via the API on behalf of the user. So that way, we can streamline some of those processes. And so this is what allows the, the delegated account access as well. And so once they go through that process, um, they can then ask customers for their, their permission to share that data. So how is this built though? So it's all in the cloud, of course. So we're using our own API service. We use OAuth. One of the things that's really key in this process is using OAuth 2. So with that user experience, we want to ensure that it's something that's familiar to users. So whenever you're using the, the Starling API and granting access, it's kind of like if you're using Facebook login. It'll take you natively to the um, Starling app, it'll ask you for that access, and you just approve it. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So what can you do with it? What are the types of things that developers could build on this full set of open APIs? So I wanted to take a moment to just kind of run through some of those use cases that we've seen so far. So on the one hand, there's payments directly from the bank account. So with Tier 5, the Payments API, there's something that's also part of the, the PSD2 legislation in the EU and UK, which is that now third parties, rather than having to go through you know, an acquire like WorldPay and the card scheme like MasterCard, they can just connect directly to your bank account, 
ask you for permission to take the payment, skip all of those middlemen, and take the, the payment directly from the bank account. Now, third parties, someone like Amazon, would quite like this because it saves them about 20 to 30 bips per transaction. But it's also the fact that then you have a better user experience and can pass those savings on to the user as well. The next thing is aggregation and financial management. So this is one of the main use cases that the regulator came up with when they were deciding to, to mandate these open APIs for other banks as well. And that was the point that for people like Mint, or there's a, a similar app in the EU called Yolt and others that are similar, the whole point is that you can pull in all of your different accounts into one view, and giving that singular view gives people better insight into their financial lives. These APIs enable that because you can easily grant um, access to someone like Yolt, who would then say, okay, I would like to access your transaction data, your account data, and they can easily and securely pull that into their app. Um, you can directly expose data for credit checks. So as part of underwriting, you actually need those transactions that would ladder up to something called an affordability assessment, which is what you need to have for, for credit, mortgages, and so on. You can perform actions on payment like loyalty. So what that means is in the UK, there's a few people innovating on this loyalty space because as probably most of you have, you'll have 20 different loyalty cards. You'll have one for a coffee shop and a grocery store and so on. And what a few of them do, such as Flux and Tail on Starling, is that they integrate our transaction API. So if a customer gives them permission, then as they go to retailers that are on the Flux or Tail platform, it just automatically recognizes that, ah, I've just bought a cup of coffee from Costa. Once I have five of those, I get one free. So it's just automatically accumulating and redeeming those points based on the transaction data. And then once you get that loyalty, they just put cash back directly into your account. So that way you don't have to remember to have your 20 different cards or scan some sort of QR code. It just happens automatically. Um, and then finally, making inferences from spending. So to help you also to set up and access other financial services. So this is how it looks in the app. So when we integrate financial services into the Starling app, it's kind of an app store model that we're bringing. So what we do is we break it down to various categories, loyalty and receipts, insurance, savings and investments, bill management, mortgages, and so on. Whenever you tap into any particular category, you then can see the integrated partners. Now to start with, we actually only mandated that they actually build out an API that could share data back into Starling, such that, for example, you could see your savings balance and your mortgage balance and all these things within Starling. What we've moved to since then is making sure they all do a two-way data flow a two-way OAuth flow, meaning that they've integrated our API. So if you tap on Wealthify, which you see here, you click Add. Once you go into the Wealthify app and indicate that you're a new customer, it'll actually bring up a screen that says, Wealthify wants to access your X, Y, and Z Starling data. This is actually in the Starling app. It's a native app to app flow. And if you say, yes, I'm happy with that, it'll say, OK, I'll take you back into the Wealthify app, and it'll auto-populate all of those fields. Now, at this part, you're probably noticing we're not deeply integrating or white labeling companies. It's not all happening end to end within the Starling app. This is important for multiple reasons. On the one hand, we don't want to do individual bespoke development to add in those partners into Starling because that's not scalable. If you do that, you're going to end up with a few partners. You can't actually have an app store where you have to develop each of the apps. So it's important that we have that shared customer relationship. But also, for scaling just from an operations perspective, we don't want to take on the customer support um, for each of these customers and to really take on the risk and regulation with each of these financial products as well. So it's important that you start in Starling. We make it easier to access by letting the customer grant us permission to share their data across. And then it streamlines the setup process. And then they go about setting up that product as they normally would. So then they would go through and say what their risk appetite is, how much they want to invest, whatever. And then that application will actually ask their permission to share their data back into Starling. So if they do that, then on the bottom right-hand corner, what you see is how it appears in the Starling app. So they'll share in high-level data. So all of a sudden, you can see your checking account balance alongside your mortgage and your insurance travel dates and your savings or investment pot, and each of those different integrated accounts all from a single view. And this was really with the goal that we wanted to be a sort of control center or hub for our customers' entire financial lives, to give them more control and insight and access. And then whenever they need to navigate to any of those partners to do any more complex option, they simply tap, click launch, and then it's automatically logged into the partner application as well. So making it easy to kind of navigate from one to the other should they need to do so. So in doing this, it was really important that we had a level of standardization. And that was for the point of quality and scalability. 
So when we first started out, we were actually doing bespoke integrations per each partner. The problem with that is it's slow and it's not scalable. So we standardized the endpoints. We created something called our implementation guide that we send to partners. And that way we can just say to the industry, if you meet these technical specifications and you meet the due diligence, you can just add yourself in as and when you're ready. And so we standardized the product details, the auth code exchange, and the refresh token. And that enables us to have this high quality user experience and to scale quickly. In the early days, we're very much aware, though, that even though we have this totally scalable platform that we've now built that's self-service, if one of these partners is to fail, it would still reflect negatively on Starling. So even though we have the ability to add in whomever we want, one, they have to have an API and be willing to do the integration. They have to meet the due diligence. Um, but also, we want to ensure that they're aligning with our security and our brand and making sure that we would be happy to introduce our customers to them, knowing that if they were to fail, that would still look bad on Starling. And so we're being quite conscious of wanting to introduce good, secure partners um, in the early days before we let it be truly open. The next thing we're looking to do as well is around making it a bit easier and having more insight into the various partners and the kind of differentiating criteria. Like how can we use data intelligently to help customers make sense of their decisions? So an example of that is if you go to get a loan in the app. What we can do is if you authorize us to share your, your transaction data across, before you even leave the app, you can see the amounts that you'd be approved for for each of the providers. So that way you know before you spend lots of time filling in documents and trying to access this line of credit, whether or not you can even receive it. So trying to continually improve that user experience, but in a standardized way. So for this, we have um, the retail offering, which is like the checking account. And then we have a business offering. And for each of these, we have the full set of open APIs. And then we also have a bespoke marketplace for each. So we have different partners in retail versus in SME. And then we also have banking as a service. So something that was fascinating is whenever we built out this full set of open APIs is that there was a lot more use cases than we had initially predicted starting to come up. One of the first ones is that as a fully licensed bank in the UK, you can directly plug in the payment schemes. Only fully licensed banks can do this. So we were the 13th member of Faster Payments, for example. But of course, we built an API around that access to Faster Payments. And all of a sudden, we had lots of other banks and fintechs coming to us asking to access those payments through our infrastructure. And if you can imagine, their only alternatives were these large income institutions where it would take them 12 months to onboard. And they would have really high fees because the traditional um, tech was very expensive to run and they had to recoup that cost somehow. And so for us, it was something that we could do in a matter of weeks and at a very, very low cost relatively. And so we ended up creating what's now called our payment services division, which other banks like RBS and N26, which is a challenger bank, um, actually use these services as part of their offering as well, um, as well as other fintechs in the ecosystem. The next thing we saw was actually to white label Starling into other accounts. So people actually wanted to use our account creation API such that you're in a fintech and they actually want you to be able to open a bank account um, but they want it to just be seamless in their flow. So we've manifested a whole other set of APIs such that, for example, we have a partner called Raisin, which is a savings marketplace. And in Raisin, you actually open an account, but it's just Starling white labeled into their service. And so it's all about how we're opening up our infrastructure to enable everything from payments and account creation to everything on the retail side with read-only transaction data, account data, up to retail payments via the API to enable this type of innovation that we hadn't previously seen um, in banking and financial services. So what's next? So in this process, we've been um, fast enough to deliver a lot of UK first. So we were the first ones to get the full banking license to offer these retail accounts, and then the first to do things like Apple Pay and Google Pay, Samsung Pay. Uh, we were the first bank actually to do Fitbit Pay full stop in the EU, which was a bit early. Uh, now Garmin Pay, just kind of all the pays, did all of that. Um, also with having the PSD2 capable APIs. So it's now become something that's been, become very important in the EU and UK, that all banks are mandated to do something similar, which is opening up these APIs. So really being a thought leader in that space in the industry. But for us, we see this as just the beginning. So we've had like a high bar, it's kind of the minimum of what we had to invest to build the bank, kind of MVP of a bank, still a bank. Okay, it's you know, minimum viable, is a lot of effort to get there, but now we have a high velocity in which we're continually able to innovate at pace. And so we're really excited for the future. I think there's lots of coming, we hope, um, 
to stay in touch. And if you have any questions after this, just feel free to come find Martin and I. We will be around. Thank you so much for your time.